transmission being one of the more difficult things, the possibilities of you know bringing wind tower solar more in a metro area, being able to produce energy in a in the area uh, instead of trying to transmitting from North Dakota to here because they have all the wind. Um, what the possibilities legally and engineering wise on that. Janelle, you want to take that on, please? Sure. Um, so uh, it's got to be delicate here because I work for a utility. Um, <laughs> if we're not producing energy, I uh, guess the utility is not making any money, right? So that's, that's definitely a, um, an internal conflict there. But, but it goes for deeper than that, which is that uh, for a residential level, it's actually still quite expensive. To, to build a lot of this. And the return on investment is ranging right now from eight to 12 years, depending on your system, on a PV array. Um, I don't know what it is for wind. I'm sure my colleagues know a little bit better. Um, and, and you have also maintenance issues at the, um, at the sort of residential and smaller scale level. That said, I will tell you my personal um, bias, which doesn't always get uh, <coughs> accepted at work, which is that I think we should be looking at, at the residential level. I think once individuals take ownership for the energy that they are using, and the energy that they are producing, they're gonna change the way they behave. And I think, you know, as you go into this field, you have to start thinking about it like that. It's not just some plant thousands of miles away, it's our own behaviors. And the truth is we can come up with as much technology as we want, but if we do not change our behaviors, and we're not more aware that gas really costs $20 a gallon or $40 a gallon, um, then we're really never gonna change. We're gonna think it's, it's, it's expendable on, in every different level. Um, so that's, that's one thing to think about, uh, you know, is the return on investment make sense? Um, what's, our, what's our thinking right now in terms of our philosophy and our approach? Um, and then from a permitting perspective, yeah, you know, it, it depends again on where, where you're located. A lot of uh, local communities, I think Aurora actually is one of them, has a rebate program to make it more affordable. And so they've created a, an expedited permitting process um, to allow for residential use. So uh, I know a lot of individual communities are embracing that and trying to facilitate that. Uh, and I think we will see a, a growth in that as we find more efficient panel systems and more efficient wind resources. Thank you so much. Craig, you want to add anything? I can add maybe a couple of thoughts on that. Again, um, there are new technologies that are out there that might allow you to, to install even a utility scale project, okay, um, say a one megawatt machine at a distribution substation to help supplement the generation uh, for the utility grid. And uh, I think those types of technologies are, are possible. A lot of the issue you know, there's really two issues with bringing things closer into metropolitan areas. The one is that people for wind, for example, generally don't want to live where it's windy. So these communities have built up in areas where the relative resource is less viable than when you get 50 miles, 100 miles, 1,000 miles out of town. So that's kind of one consideration. The other consideration, this is the bigger one, and this is kind of what Janelle was, was, was pointing to, is that acceptance by the community of a large wind turbine in their, uh, amongst their, their, in their midst uh, is not real high. And, um, and uh, usually when you get into the, uh, the uh, ur more urban settings, you can get so much resistance that the cost to just permit and address all of the issues uh, associated with permitting ty that type of facility become prohibitive. Uh, that uh, so prohibitive that it really economics uh, fall away pretty quickly. And I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll even go so far as to say when we were doing projects out in, in Texas, okay, if we had a landowner that was a rancher that understood the relationship between his livelihood and the land, we could get a wind turbine project, good acceptance of a wind turbine project pretty easily. If the landowner happened to be an attorney, say, from Dallas that had his weekend place out in the, uh, uh, you know, 100 miles out of town, the resistance became inc so incredible that in a couple of cases we had to abandon the effort. Um, you know, so it, it is that acceptance of the technology also that, uh, that really drives the ability to do some of the things closer into these urban areas. Thank you. We actually worked with a group um, that was looking at doing a natural gas um, micro generation facility that would then fire you know steam powered micro turbines um, and it was in an urban area and we started working with a, a utility company on the notion of creating micro turbines or micro generation facilities because you have uh, what's the seven percent or so is just transmission loss and you, you want to increase your your 
efficiency, you can do that right there. And it actually becomes a fairly viable model, particularly because of the long um, approval process and the extraordinary amount of money to build a new plant. Remember that you, you can't get away from the economics to answer these questions. Utilities are a stair-step model, which means they invest a ton of money and they don't invest, you know, and, and, and then they try to get as much power out of that set of assets before they have to invest another ton of money. So it's all sort of dealing with the demand. Um, so micro generation facilities can actually be a very efficient economic model. The other trade-off you have to consider anytime you're looking at renewable energy in these answers is relative to what? I happen to live in a state that we have an extraordinarily low cost of power to the consumer to business. Why is it so low? Because they've been very, very successful at having uh, coal-fired power as the dominant producer and stifling any legislation to make them clean up their facilities. TVA just entered into an agreement with EPA to settle and fix their thing. Alabama Power instead is taking them to court. It's just a different mentality. They spend more than three times what the other southern company, power companies combined on lobbying. So it's just a different mindset. So what happens in Alabama is natural gas steam-fired microturbines is not cost-effective vis-a-vis coal-fired power because we are subsidizing the cost of the coal-fired power with health costs that are not, that are not being paid for. So it's really not as, as simple as just is this better than this is better than this. Um, but I do think there is a future for you know, micro-generation facilities um, to extend the life of the existent assets, if nothing else, uh, so that you can avoid the stair step in the model. But right now, so much of um, renewable energy is painted with a political brush. Uh, and we work very, very hard with our clients and, and, and in the courses we teach, I teach and stuff to, to say, you know, this isn't a Republican or Democrat or a liberal or conservative issue. So changing the language of engagement is an essential part of the equation as well. But right now you have certain places in the country where it is automatically a political statement and that may be hurting things as much as anything else. The transmission picture is, is uh, you know, we're, we're reaching a saturation point in a lot of the regional areas. And going back to what Craig said, you know, the, the possible answer is energy storage. Uh, you know, you have to imagine that building this infrastructure is going to cost a lot of money and where are those funds going to come from. Uh, so that's kind of what uh, some folks in the industry are taking a look at. You know, what can we do if, if we put a wind project in, for example, in, in central Iowa or northwestern Iowa right now for, is an area where it, there's not enough transmission to carry power out. So they're looking at the possibility of using wind turbines to generate anhydrous ammonia to use it as a fuel source and a fertilizer source. You know, so those are possible some ways to still incorporate the use of uh, wind, solar, other renewable resources, but keep it regional instead of uh, building transmission.